I'm here to talk about a mystery today. I came all the way from California to talk to you about a mystery in the technology industry. And very specifically to start, I want to start by looking at uh, where are the top 20 companies uh, today and where's the value in these companies. So if you take a look at the top 20 companies in the world by market capitalization, you have about 2.7 trillion US dollars ascribed to these companies. And when I when, when you look at this, you take a look at, okay, some names that everybody in this room recognizes, uh, both from the US, from Europe, all over the world, in many different categories. So I took a look at this and wanted to better understand this and said, okay, what happens to that aggregate market capitalization if you take the e-tailers out of it? So you take eBay and you take Amazon out of it. You end up with about $2.6 trillion of value. And then you take services out of this, and you end up with about $2.3 trillion worth of value. And then next, you take software out of this. You still have about $1.5 trillion worth of value in these companies. Uh, Apple is clearly a big one, but even if you take Apple out of this, and Apple's about $625 billion in market cap, it's still worth more than software. So the question is, when you think about starting a company, why are so many companies started in software but not in hardware? And what I'm here to share with you today is that I think that is about to change. And when all the entrepreneurs in this room are thinking about where to start companies going forward, I encourage everybody to think beyond the traditional web, the traditional software, uh, the traditional e-tail, and start to think about physical things that we interact with. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about a little bit today. So specifically, 54% is what you have of the, of the top uh, 20 companies have this value. So here's a traditional view of hardware companies, very physical companies. Uh, if you think of the iPod, you think about smartphones, et cetera. Uh, it's been very simple. It's put a bunch of pieces together. But what's changed is the internet. The internet has changed profoundly the way that you build hardware startups. And I think there are a lot of great examples. There are some companies that have been created here that are a little under the radar but are, are rising very rapidly. And I'd start with one in particular. You may have seen the why thing scale. Why would somebody need to change a scale? But when you think about the purpose of a scale, it's often to keep your weight, keep your weight down or lose weight. And to do that, you have to keep weight. So this simply adds... Uh, a Wi-Fi component to it, so it's connected to the internet, so you can actually record your weight automatically. All you have to do is step onto the scale, and it measures your body fat percentage as well. It's, it's an incredible aid to doing this because it's internet powered. So another example that you may or may not be familiar with is, imagine a pair of ski goggles, and those ski goggles have a very small micro display built into them. And there's actually a lot of technology here. You have it connected to the internet. You can see when you go down the hill how fast you went. You can see whether you jumped higher than your friends. Uh, but in order to get this to work, you can't just have the display here. You actually have to build in technology so that the focal length looks like it's about eight feet away. And this is a company that's growing very quickly. You may have heard of Google Goggles, but startups like Recon are actually building this today. Another exciting startup coming out of Silicon Valley that's doing hundreds of millions in revenue today is Jawbone. Uh, Jawbone is building peripherals for different smart devices. What you see here is you see the Jambox. They also build headsets, and they have an up uh, armband that records your uh, physical exertion, so you can actually keep track of how many calories you've consumed. And another great leading-edge example of what's going on in this hardware revolution is Nest. And you look at this. It's a, it's a simple, elegant device. It's connected to the Internet, and it's a thermostat. You would say, why would you need to change the thermostat? And the reason that you need to change the thermostat, and this is one of many examples in the hardware world, is that in the typical residence, about half of the energy usage is through heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. However, and this is one of the really strange things about it, is nobody programs their thermostat. And what this thermostat does is it has motion sensors built in, and you just turn it up when you want to turn it up, and you turn it down when you want to turn it down, and because it's connected to the internet, it actually learns from you. It gets better with time. And Nest has found that a huge proportion, almost 100% of their thermostats self-program and on average save, save their users money. So what's changed? Why are these uh, startups starting to happen now? 
And I'd say there are several key enablers that are happening here. Uh, you can see, uh, first off, this set, the technology set, the technology stack. You have changes going on in chips today where you can build, whether it's the smartphone, whether you can build these devices, where chips are becoming close to free. You can actually uh, buy chips, Wi-Fi chips, for a dollar or less than a dollar. You can buy different wireless networking chips. You can buy storage. You can buy computation. And there's just huge breakthroughs that are going um, on right now to be able to enable this. Another is the availability of the smartphone. So the smartphone actually acts as a gateway to all these devices. If you look at the devices I was showing you before, the smartphone makes it easy for you to interact with your scale. It makes it easy if you've left your house and you meant to turn the temperature up or down because you're going to be gone for a couple of days to control your thermostat remotely. Uh, you take a look at Amazon Web Services, you have cloud services that you can tap into for close to free, and you can do it on demand, which is incredibly powerful for startups because you can just buy by the drink. If you need a little bit of capacity, you spend a little bit of money. You need more capacity because you're successful, you buy more. And these things were never possible before, and they're really enabling startups today. And then the one I put here in the middle is, um, why do I have a charger up there? It's because a lot of people have these chargers. There's standardization around this. So it further lowers the cost of actually building these devices. So what's next? And this is another key enabler, inexpensive manufacturing. If you take a look on the left, there's a company called MakerBot. They're building 3D printers. It's based in New York City. And if you take a look at the lower left, you can see how easy it is just putting software in and connecting to the cloud to be able to create these different devices. You have puzzles, you can build toys, you can build a car. In fact, a lot of people um, are surprised to hear that you can actually make weapons using this, which is unbelievable use of technology today um, to be able to just have software to create a gun or a knife and actually have it created in a 3D printer like that. And then the other is Foxconn. Foxconn is uh, pretty well known as one of the major uh, ODMs for Apple creating the, or bringing the iPod to market. But what a lot of people don't know about this is you can use those same assembly lines. Startups can tap into those same assembly lines to build in volume for very low cost up front. And then the final piece, and this is just as important, is social media. And how does social media uh, come into uh, building hardware products, you might ask. And the way that it comes in is a couple of things. One is, because of social media, if you build a great product that people love, they can promote it to their friends. They can tell their friends about it. You don't need to have big advertising budgets if you build a great product that connects with a consumer that people want to promote. And that's where Twitter and Facebook come in. But there's this other new trend that you're going to hear about later today from uh, Eric from Pebble called Kickstarter. And this is effectively crowdsourcing, crowdfunding of money. So here you have what a typical Kickstarter campaign looks like. You go ahead, you put together a video about your product, and it gives you an idea of, um, OK, the campaign will go on for another nine days. They have a target. And people will actually donate money because they want to see the product happen. This has never happened before. But it's become a trend that's emerging very rapidly, and in fact, if you take a look at Pebble, this is a company that based on an idea for a smartphone watch and a great video demonstrating the utility of a watch that would be connected to the internet and could run different applications on it, raised over $10 million over the course of a month. That's $10 million that the founder and the team was able to raise without taking money from people like me and being able to have no dilution and effectively figure out what the demand is going to be for the watch in advance and actually get the money to be able to pay for the production of the watch. Another great example is Ouya. Ouya is looking to disrupt Xbox, the PlayStation 2, the Wii, with a controller, which is a beautiful controller, and a device that out the door will cost $99 to the consumer. It's based on Android. It's based on a free OS. These guys put together a Kickstarter campaign, raised over $8 million. Another great example, which you may have seen, is Lifex. These guys are creating a light bulb that changes color. It has an IP address. It's connected to the internet. And you can use your smartphone to change the color of the light bulb that you put into any ordinary socket. 
And so far, these guys have raised over a million dollars in Kickstarter. So there are these profound changes that are going on in the sorts of startups that are going to be coming out of Silicon Valley and around the world. So what's next? That's the big question. And it, the things that people have talked about in sci-fi are actually starting to happen. One of those is smartphone robots. So on the left, you have Remotive. This is a company that is started in Las Vegas, of all places. And it's just this little track device. You, you pop uh, a smartphone into it. It could be an iPhone. It could be an Android device. But what is so amazing about this is I can buy that platform. I can buy it for 100 bucks. I can pop the smarts of the smartphone into it. And then because it has a front-facing camera and it has a screen, it can connect to Facebook, and it can recognize all your friends. So imagine a smartphone that with a little bit of software and a developer platform actually can get the personality of a pet and can recognize your different friends as it moves around. And then you also have uh, the double remote presence robot on the left. It's kind of like a Segway. If you've ever seen a Segway, it balances on two wheels, and it's up at eye height. And again, it, 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 it uses technology that's already out there. Another exciting company, very interesting company, is the idea of wearable displays. This is a company based in the UK. They have this crazy thing called this, the T-shirt OS. And imagine a display that's on your shirt that could show your tweets, it can say whatever you want, and imagine being able to buy a shirt like this for $100, a couple hundred dollars. Looks like an ordinary shirt, but it could light up and send messages, uh, maybe not so subliminal. And then a final one, this is actually a nicotine patch here, but this is one that really gets you to think about where hardware is going. Uh, this is a company that just, that's just gotten started out in Silicon Valley. Imagine a patch that you put on your arm. It's non-invasive. It doesn't go beneath the skin, but it can measure your blood chemistry in real time. Imagine it being able to measure cholesterol, glucose levels, uh, hydration. It could be of a lot of interest, not just to athletes, but also uh, from a medical point of view and connecting that to a smartphone and being able to see in real time what's going on with your blood chemistry. So we're on a cusp of a huge revolution and the market already ascribes more than half of the value of the top 20 IT companies in the world to hardware. And there are four common characteristics here. One is they're all connected to the internet. They're able to leverage cloud services. This was never possible before, and it could be done for close to free. These, number two, are some of the biggest ideas that you can possibly imagine. You have companies like Nest that are going after the thermostat. Their objective is to sell a thermostat to everybody in the world. And the ability to go and disrupt these industries, building hardware is unparalleled because you can do this very cheaply now. Um, third, you can actually build great brands today. Uh, social media makes that possible. If you build a product that really connects with your consumer, really connects with your audience, you can actually rise above this. And then finally, this is where real technology innovation is going. And as an entrepreneur, I would think that everybody wants to build something that they're going to be proud of. And perhaps instead of trying to figure out the next e-tail idea or figure out the next uh, web property, building something physical that people interact with in their daily lives is really a powerful concept. So I'd like to leave everybody with a, f a final thought here. This is a global opportunity. This is not a Silicon Valley phenomenon. If you take a look at just a few of these companies that I talked about today, you have Recon Instruments is based in Canada. You have MakerBot in New York City. You have Nest that's out in California. But Nest just designs it. It's actually manufactured out in China. And you look at companies like YThings that I talked about up front. They're based in France. And one of the things that's been interesting to me, this is my first trip to Turkey, is talking to some of the, some of the investors in the entrepreneurial community here and people saying, you know, Turkey might not be ready for this. But I would throw out the challenge to everybody in this room that instead of copying what's been done and doing it better here, to start thinking outside the box and create something new and great against this phenomenon that's happening. And if you want to be very successful, and this is one of the things that I've learned from my time in Silicon Valley, don't think about what's conventional. Think about who your audience is. Think about who your customers are and create something new and great. And that's the, the challenge that I would throw out to everybody in this room is to think beyond software and to think into some of these areas. It's a great, exciting new opportunity. Thank you.